The Steinway Mansion has been associated with the Steinway family. Um, there's no doubt about it that it is certainly a unique building. A group from the Smithsonian came here to make a tour of New York and see uh, Steinway associated sites. And uh, of course, one of the important ones was the mansion. I inherited that part from my father. I love it, it's a great architectural gem. It's a gem. Benjamin Pike Jr., who was a <clears throat> importer and a retailer of philosophical instruments, that's what they called them in the old days, laden jar, telescopes, and so on. He and his father decided to build a manor house. He made it in a Victorian style, an Italian villa style. There was no Queensborough Bridge, and there was no way to get these stones, these massive granite stones in, they had to bring in by, by water from the East River. Evidently, I don't know where the stones came from. Either they came from New Hampshire or Vermont and came down a river, or they were ballast for ships that came from England. And he had them made in England, hand-hewn and sent over. Well, there's a tremendous amount. You could see by the size of this building, the amount of those stones, and each stone must weigh about 150 to 200 pounds each. The house itself has uh, 26 rooms. It's all granite, and uh, it was made with tremendous beams. They must be four inches or five inches wide by 14 inches high and 40, 30, 40 foot long. Yeah, and uh, they support this roof. Pike had designed this with a tower. So it goes up to about uh, 80 feet from the base. And, but all the rest of the building is an Italian at Villa style. Benjamin Pike Jr. died in 1864 and his father outlived him. He was 85. He only enjoyed this house for maybe uh, four or five years. And uh, his widow then had the house and lived in it till 1869, 70. That's when the Steinway family purchased the house from her. The Steinways came out to, at that time, Long Island City, which was a separate city, and purchased some four or five farms, some about, about 400 acres, and decided to assemble a community. They started from scratch. You see a panoramic picture there of the area. It was nothing but scrubland, swamp, uh, a few struggling farms, and not much else. Steinways, however, in their mind's eye, saw an entire community with all the institutions, the libraries, the kindergartens, the churches, the streets, the housing, everything was put into place bit by bit by the Steinways. William Steinway was a remarkable fellow because he, he arrived here at the age of 15 already speaking English. He must have studied it on the other side. And in the development of the business, his two older brothers, Charles and Henry and the old man, were needed in the factories. To sell their initial few pianos, uh, the wife did the books, Heinrich Steinweg, who started the company, um, and his sons, each one did a different part. One made cases, another one worked on the action set. And the daughter actually gave free piano lessons just so they can get those pianos out the door until they made their first few sales in America. So William was delegated to buy and sell property and negotiate leases and things like that, became a thoroughgoing American businessman and uh, uh, with an eye out for all kinds of opportunities. So. When they bought this house and the acreage that went with it, I think Pike had died, who was the original owner who built it was Benjamin Pike. So it was, it was a lot of money, I think 70,000 bucks they paid for the mansion, plus certain property that went with it. The Steinways were having problems, labor problems in Manhattan. And also they had a problem with that draft riots 
they, uh, they were very frightened with what was going to happen because their windows were broken and uh, the, the mobs were very unruly at the time. The Steinways came out to this location for a very good reason. If you saw the movie Gangs of New York, it came out a few years ago, you'd realize that New York was a very violent place. As a matter of fact, the draft riots actually threatened the Steinway factory. Fortunately, one of the sons was an officer of the New Union Army and it actually had stockpiled munitions at the plant. And when, they, when the riots, the rioters heard about that, they made the uh, they actually avoided uh, attacking the plant. Uh, also, New York City was, uh, at that time, the beginning of the labor movement. There were some, uh, at least 200 piano manufacturers in New York City alone, and when somebody would strike, all the workers within that guild would lay down their tools in sympathy for that strike. He wanted to develop that area as a, not just a company town in the sense of Pullman, but he wanted to develop it, so he attracted other industries. There was the Astoria Silkwalks up on uh, Steinway Street and Dittmar's in that area, gone now, of course, and other businesses around there that uh, he became interested in or low, uh, lent money to. Everything that had to come here had to come by boat. The, uh, the 86th Street ferry that came over to Hallett's Cove, Hallett's Point, uh, used to land on 1st Street in Astoria. Then you had to traverse over to the mansion, which was another 15-minute ride. And so you had to have wagons to transport this stuff. The Steinways also uh, were very much interested in getting a direct link to New York, between Queens and New York. Uh, for example, the Brooklyn Bridge uh, created an explosive growth in Brooklyn uh, when it was opened up uh, uh, in the 1880s. Um, there was a lot of uh, pressure uh, by, the, pe by the, uh, the leadership in Queens to develop a similar bridge to Manhattan. There was a group called the Committee of Forty, and William Steinway was one of the uh, charter members of this group. He was way ahead of his time on the Steinway Tunnel. Certainly that idea, if we had it today, was just wonderful. What they wanted to do was dig under Manhattan, through Manhattan, out over the river into Jersey and, if they, and interconnect with the things in Manhattan. They started the tunnel, got a few hundred feet. There was a terrible explosion in Hunter's Point, blew out the windows in several blocks. Six, seven guys were killed, and that, was, that brought it to a, uh, a halt. And the tunnel sat there, uncompleted, until it was taken over by the city of New York and was opened up into Grand Central Station. That tunnel today, of course, is the number seven line. If you ever go out to Shea Stadium or, the Flush, or to uh, Flushing, uh, to the tennis stadium, um, you are uh, paying respect to the genius of William Steinway by going through the Steinway tubes, the Steinway tunnel. He was interested in the development all the way along. Of course, they put the streets in. There are houses that you can still see on 20th Avenue. The Steinway Reformed Church uh, was a small schoolhouse uh, that was built in the 1820s, and the local farmers would actually attend uh, church school there uh, with their kids on Sundays. Well, when the building burned down in the 1870s, shortly after the Steinways moved into the location, uh, William Steinway and some of the uh, local people uh, decided to uh, put some money up for a church building. Up there on Dittmar's Avenue, there is the church, which was created by Steinway. Uh, Mostly, I think Theodore, the older brother, had just died and left $5,000, which was enough money to build the church, which had priorly been further down on river and uh, what they called Shaw Road. Uh, and that property was turned into a library and kindergarten, and then there was this church on Dittmar's, which still exists. And when Steinway Hall on 14th Street was converted into office space, the organ was sent out there. I'm not sure whether it's still there or not, but it was a Jardine organ, nothing special, but I mean, and pipe organ from Steinway Hall went to the uh, church. Another interesting thing too, typical of the Dutch Reformed churches of the time, it's not a four-sided building. It was felt that uh, the devil would reside in the corner. So if you went to Dutch Reformed churches at that time, 
they're either eight-sided or they're oddly shaped buildings. And if you go into the Steinway Reformed Church, you actually see the roof uh, in all kinds of rather interesting geometric patterns on the inside of it. But the church itself is an absolute gem. He became extremely interested in the Astoria community, the trolley line that ran from there, the North Beach Amusement Park, which is where LaGuardia Field is now. In order to have good workers, the workers had to be happy. So they gave the workers a number of benefits, amenities associated with the plant, one of them being a, an amusement park that they developed for their employees, which was called North Beach Amusement Park. North Beach was sort of a, um, a park that was along the Long Island Sound, had bathing pavilions that shoot to shoots, it had merry-go-rounds, uh, pony rides, all kinds of dining facilities. Um, it was considered to be probably the premier attraction uh, along the, uh, the north coast of Long Island. And the trolley used to stop right there, and everyone used to get off, whether they wanted to go swimming or the dance halls or the rides. So it was a tremendous place, or the picnic grounds. North Beach was wildly successful. Thousands of people would congregate on North Beach every weekend. Uh, there were accounts that, uh, that there were literally 10,000, 20,000 people would show up uh, on a typical Saturday. And you've got to realize, too, at this period of time, people worked often five and a half, six days a week. So this was their only chance to really get out to enjoy life. Now, these were not places uh, of uh, really wild carousing or anything like that. These were actually family entertainment locations where the women would get together and gossip as they could watch their kids on the swings. The husbands would talk politics with each other. The German beer garden was an important part of the culture of uh, late 19th century America. In 1919, it was shut down. Uh, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment with World War I. Also, uh, people had automobiles. What really killed North Beach was prohibition. So the city of New York decided to uh, actually buy the, the, the land. Initially, it started as North Beach Airport, um, and then it, uh, uh, it was taken over by the city and renamed for LaGuardia. The Steinways also were um, looking at so many other different things uh, besides making pianos. One of the things that they considered um, was building uh, automobiles and boats at their factory. Uh, they were very interested in motive power. Uh, they became friends with a guy named Gottlieb Dame Lear. Gottlieb was the man who perfected the first internal combustion engine. One of the odder things that William had was this Daimler Motor Company, which he really thought of that internal combustion engine as a way to run trolleys, anything to get rid of the horses. The horses were a pain in the neck. And then, of course, the uh, electric motor came in as the obvious solution to the trolleys. But he continued this Daimler Motor Company, and they made mostly boats. And he lost a bundle of money in that that, uh, that didn't develop. But it had a, a location on Steinway Street, not far from our factory, not far from the mansion, um, where the, this company held forth. And the engines were actually made in Hartford by um, some old machine company up there. And then they put them in these boats, and they had a lot of boats uh, that they sold or attempted to sell. The Steinways were also responsible for developing a lot of institutions within their community. They developed one of the first kindergartens in America. They developed a circulating library. Now, this circulating library, which was taken over by Long Island City when it was a separate city, and later by the city of New York in 1898, today is the cornerstone of the Queensboro Public Library Queensborough Public Library is the largest circulating library in the country. And a portrait of William Steinway, who was the initial benefactor of this circulating library, has still stayed with the system throughout all these years. And if you go to the Steinway branch of the Queensborough Public Library, you'll still see William staring at you from the wall at the reading room. The Steinways also had surface lines. Uh, they managed to assemble all the trolley lines in, uh, in Long Island City uh, under their control. They later sold it to a group of investors, and through a series of, of uh, sales, those, those, those lines, of course, became today's modern bus network uh, in, um, in Long Island City, Astoria. We give a tour of the Steinway Piano Factory. Every Steinway piano is like every person. Every person has a unique face, has unique fingerprints, has a unique personality, 
The same thing with the Steinway, with the Steinway piano. Steinway piano is from a living creature. It's from wood. It's from trees. And every Steinway piano has a unique personality to it. Some people like the piano for jazz. Other people like a piano for classical music. Some people like a piano to accompany a singer. Some people like it for opera. Every piano, just like every person, has a different taste, has a different attribute. And it is something intangible to watch the workers on that shop floor create a piano from a piece of furniture into something that many people consider to be a member of their family, to have a Steinway piano. They built their Riker Avenue plant, which still exists today, and they built their Dittmars Avenue plant. Uh, one was used for making cases, another one was used for, it had mills, it had different functions in different uh, facilities. There are factories on Dittmars Avenue further along there, uh, 4302 and 4502 Dittmars that were belong, built by Steinway after William's time, uh, one of which is now being converted into apartments. And it's very interesting, 4502 Dittmars, I went by there the other day, and this old brick factory, it was typical brick, you know, wall-bearing factory, has been converted to uh, apartments, and I think some of them are for old people, I don't know just what. So that's a conversion that's uh, interesting. The other factory had already been converted to uh, you can drive up there and there are stores and nice restaurants and things like that. We were all supposed to learn the business. So when I started in 1937, we hung out in the lumberyard and went through and tried to do each operation and I got a lifelong respect for the skills involved in making pianos because we were allowed to try it and see how hard it is to do it and talk to and work with a lot of the uh, skilled workmen at that time. And uh, so I did that for two or three years. Then uh, uh, the war came along and I started to do some, some of the buying and uh, work for we, we, the only job we could get was a contract for uh, troop carrying gliders because uh, pianos were forbidden for about three years during the war. Because we used so-called cr um, critical materials, a certain amount of brass and steel and things like that, and there was a limitation on it, and they cut it out as a non-essential. So for two or three years, we were not allowed to make pianos. And um, uh, finally, we found a guy who had a contract for this troop-carrying glider, and we rented him the 4302 Dittmars factory and got the contract to make all the woodwork. And it was a great big thing, could carry 15 guys or a Jeep or an ordnance. But it was used uh, several times during the war, uh, somewhat disastrously because you could stick your finger through this thing and uh, the brave guys who were flying and using those things are really of my great admiration. And so that, I don't know how I got off on that, but that's what we did uh, during the war in, the, in those old Dittmars factories. And then after the war, when I came back, they made me factory manager and we had too much space. So that's when we arranged to uh, build uh, the Steinway Place factory as it exists today. They made me president in 1955. My father was getting uh, sick at that time. He died in 57 and I was chosen as president of the company, and so I operated the company from then through the time when we sold the business to CBS uh, in 1972. The Steinways formed a relationship with the arts community. They actually brought artists in from Europe, various groups, uh, to perform at Steinway Hall, which was at that time at 14th Street, which was the leading concert venue in the United States at that time. I like to say that Steinway Hall was sort of a combination of the Lincoln Center, um, Carnegie Hall, and the Kennedy Center, all in one facility. For example, when Dickens, when he gave his famous lecture in, in America, uh, kicked off his series at Steinway Hall in New York City. William himself died relatively young. He was only in his very early 60s. He died in mid-1890s. Uh, after his death, the family decided that they wanted to focus all of their attention on building pianos. Uh, his interest in North Beach uh, was sold by the family. They gave up the, the Dame Lear 
uh, patents also, you know. They're just focused on making pianos. And now, I'll tell you a little about how my father bought this house. My father emigrated from Turkey, where Armenians from Turkey. My father was about the last person allowed out of Turkey as a young man. And he was 16 or 17 years old at the time. How my father came to this house was that finally when he ended, when he came to America, he ended up on 28th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue in one of those apartments, tenement apartments. And there was four or five of his friends that were living there already had come to America. And now he was one of them. So the, the thing they used to do in the summertime was come out to William Steinway and George Eretz North Beach Amusement Park. They could afford this kind of a place. And the trolley ride from Manhattan, from 59th Street and 2nd Avenue, right out to the entrance to the park for the first time he looks up from the trolley and he sees this mansion. And he used to help his father building stone homes. Now from the first time he came to America to now all he ever saw was the brick homes. And so now he sees this house and, and he, he's taken aback and he, and he says to his friends, that's the kind of house I want to own, and someday I'm going to buy that house. And they said, listen, that's only for the wealthy. You can't even speak English, and you're talking about buying that house? Well, 13 years later, he bought the house. My father got the word from that person that was on a trolley with him that this house was for sale. So my father was just married six months. His business, his business was going well. He had just got married. He was so happy. And now the guy calls him up and tells him, he was a realtor by that time, and tells him, you know that mansion you used to like in, in, uh, in Astoria? Yeah. He said, well, it's up for sale. So my father says, have you got the key? He said, yes. So he brings the key to my father's shop. That weekend, my father hires a cab or a livery cab. And now, he and my mother, he tells my mother about this house. She comes out and she sees this house. Now, she's 17. And the biggest thing she's ever seen was an apartment. And now she sees this house. My mother's name was Shami, or Shami Ram. She had said, I had six months idyllic life when I first got married. When we got this house, all of a sudden, it was work, 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 and it was. My mother kept this house immaculate. From the attic to the basement, she did all the cleaning. If my father had let her go, she would have had a house full of great antiques because she had, it was inborn in her. She didn't have any taste, she didn't have any education. She just knows what she liked and everything she bought was right. She said he went crazy in this house. He ran from the top attic rooms down to the basement, around to every room at least 20 times. He looked at everything, checked the outside, inside, and so on. If I have to live in this cockeyed New York, he said, I want to live in this house. This is just as countrified as the Catskill Mountains. Don't forget, when he bought it, he bought it in 1920. Uh, six and they sold all the lots of the Steinway estate to individuals. So who bought two lots, three lots to build homes? He buys the four lots, a hundred by a hundred or five lots with an additional lot going to 42nd Street. That's all he could afford. There were only three owners of this mansion. Pike built it, the Steinways bought it from them, and then my father bought it from the Steinways. The deal was made, he moves in. The place had a lot of wallpaper, half coming down and so on, and no electricity. He calls the Steinways and he said, 
I have no water. They said, we know. We closed it. He said, what am I going to do for water? They said, go to Genovese Plumbing House at the time on Steinway Street, and they'll give you a pipe of water from 19th Avenue, which they did eventually. One old man came and dug up from uh, this one block and dug up to the mansion with an inch and a half pipe and then brought water from the city water down below. Now there's no electricity. So now he goes to, uh, you got to go with a hat in hand to, uh, to the Con Edison to plead that he needs the poles to come down here. There's not, they have no, there's no reason why they're going to put a pole down here or poles down here for electricity. There's no other customer. <coughs> but they did. When the mansion was, was closed and sold, um, the, 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 the electricity and the water and all the services of the mansion came from the factory. So when it was sold, they cut all the lines. So when, Helber when Mike Halberian's family took over the mansion, they had no electricity, no water. They had to bring in all these facilities themselves to actually make the mansion operational. The heating system was a hot air system. And uh, the minute he started that hot air system, there was dust all over the, the, the house. It wasn't corrected. Something was wrong with the hot air system at the time. So what did he do? He calls the company up and they put in steam throughout the whole house. Now the electricity, the steam, the water, the painting of the entire house, pulling down all the wallpaper, he ran out of money. He had to borrow money, the banks wouldn't give him any money, from a private mortgager. And it was a thing called the demand mortgage in the old days. And uh, they don't allow that anymore. But the guy would lend the money to you, and, and upon demand in two months, either you come up with that mortgage or he takes the property away from you. Well, in 1928, there was, the stock market was going crazy. So this guy wanted to take his money out and put it in the stock market and he came to my father and he told my father he needed that money. My father said, well, I haven't got it. I spent all my money in the mansion. He said, well, I have no, uh, you, you promised that you signed this. So my father had a dilemma. He had no money left. So he went and all his friends they were, they were poor people, but who amassed $2,000, $1,000, They all came together and gave him the $17,000 that was required to pay off this mortgage. So he goes down, redeems the mortgage. The guy subsequently lost all his money in the stock market in 29, but that's beside the point. And he redeems this mortgage. And they had a mortgage burning and a big party here with all his friends. My father was a tailor. Later, he ventured out and became, went into the clothing business. And, uh, but before that, he was just a tailor. And he was a fine tailor. And what happened uh, in 1929 to 1941, he never paid a penny property tax. Now, the property tax wasn't that high, but it was high enough. And the city in New York had taken back all these homes, didn't want any more property. What he had done was convert the, the house to a four-family house, basically. And we lived in one part of it, and then three other families rented and that's how he lived, because he couldn't make any money in the tailor shop, very little. Athenagoras, this Greek primate, he must have been six foot eight, and he had the headdress on that make him look, he, when I was 10 years old, I looked up at him, he looked like 10 feet tall to me. I could never believe with a long, big beard. 
Anyway, he was going through the house looking at every room. And at that time, he offered my father, during the Depression, $75,000 for the house. Now, for $75,000, my father could have bought the whole block in Manhattan. My father said no. And everybody was pleading with him to sell. He said no. And he withstood that offer. Arthur Nagoris went up to Westchester and built that, that Greek orphanage that's up there. But he wanted to put that Greek orphanage in this house and buy all the surrounding properties. He wanted this house as the focal point because they just put St. Demetrius up there in Astoria and they wanted the Greek came into Astoria, starting to come in, and he wanted this. To show you the love my father had for this house, the money could not influence him. I don't care what the guy offered, he wouldn't have sold it because he enjoyed it so much. And he used to do all the repairs himself and he did all the work himself, digging the garden and the trees and so on and so forth. My, that was only on Sunday because that's all he had. And all his first son, his son had was to help him. I had to be his helper. He'd be on a roof. I need a screwdriver. Run downstairs, get a screwdriver, run all the way up and get, all right, now you better get me the hammer with some nails. Uh, run down again, come up again. 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, my father had to go down in the wintertime and get the fire started. Not started, but it's been banked and get it going again. You pull open the thing and shovel all the coal in and work the ashes down from the grates. Now came Saturday. There's about 20 baskets of ashes uh, that my father had taken down and now piled up in a corner and I had to go down with the bushels with a shovel to shovel it into those baskets and then carry it out to the road. There was a place called Muff's Boatyard, which became Buzzy's, but basically it was Muff's Boatyard. Otzi Muff, I remember, because I used to play with his son. I used to go to school, and now if I invited the kids over, they thought I was the richest person in the world. They had to come down at least three, four blocks, but they did because they wanted to see this famous place. I used to climb the pear trees and the apple trees here. There was one gigantic cherry tree. The cherries rivaled the ones from Washington State, the black cherries that was right here. It was love, immense. And there were about uh, six or seven horse chestnut trees. Now the Steinways planted all this here and kept these trees. They were magnificent. They placed them in the right spot. And here I am growing in the midst of this here luxury. And my poor father is struggling to hold on to the house. But for, as far as a kid knows, I don't know any different. I'm eating every day. I don't even, my, I don't hear any word about the problems they had growing up in a depression. Not one word. Anytime I wanted a suit of clothes, my father was in the clothing business and he'd fix up a suit for me, or I'd go out and buy it. So I never had a problem with anything. I just, uh, I just totally loved the place. And I told you, and my sister and I grew up like this. We had a great time. But it was the Halberian family that actually restored it and actually brought uh, many of the, uh, the artifacts that gives you a feeling for what life was like for a relatively, for a wealthy family in late 19th century. And it's very interesting too. Henry Z. Steinway uh, makes uh, no um, qualms about it. He says that uh, now that actually the Helberian family has owned the Steinway mansion longer than the Steinway family. And he sometimes calls it the Helberian Steinway mansion, which I think is a very nice gesture on, on, on his part. This is one of the fine cast iron buildings in New York City. They keep talking about the ones in Manhattan, yes.
But they're, they're not ornate. This house has got the ornate cast iron. They're magnificent uh, doors. They, uh, I don't know where they were constructed, whether they were American. I think they were American. But they're very heavy doors. And uh, they were always painted. My father received them painted. He painted them. And then when I came here, I took all the paint off the doors. And I stained them. Well, they're not good. They're weather-beaten now. And so you could take them down again, you stain them again. You remove whatever you got there, and they come out magnificent. There are a pair of doors from the uh, foyer entrance to the main, to the big hall, the center hall. And they depicted Benjamin Pike had the scientific instruments of the day etched onto those two glass panels. Well, there are hunting scenes, see? Uh, and uh, don't forget, it was the time period, the 1850s, and it was sort of a manor house, a country house, with partridge hunting and so on. And so Pike depicted that. Since I had a New York City landmark, it was very apropos for me to have a New York library uh, in that room. And uh, it's a fascinating room. Uh, anyone that knows New York City history come out and they see the quantity and the quality of my books there. They're very amazed at my, uh, the way I saved those books. And I amassed a, uh, a collection of about 6,000 uh, books and articles and pictures of New York City. And I still go out every day still buying New York City books. The skylight in the library allows the light to come into the library. It was a, and then it was, it's also very decorative. And also the library was very decorative all around. This chandelier was do donated to the Grand Street Boys Club by the Whitney's. And there's the chandelier up 40 feet, and now I'm under the chandelier with my arms outstretched, my arms outstretched about six feet, and I'm trying to v visualize that chandelier down below and whether it could fit in my, in between my uh, balcony. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I buy it. I wanted to motorize it. <clears throat> And I called St. Patty's, I called uh, Lincoln Center. Any place that had a chandelier that came up and down, I tried to find, can't find it. Finally, I found a guy, an electrician, that says I could do it. So I said, okay. He says, we gotta buy a piece of steel, about uh, 12 foot, to go upstairs in the, between the beams. It had to go through this half moon window and then placed between the beams and then get myself a hoist that can handle that chandelier, put it on top of the steel beam, come all the way down, put the chandelier, hook the chandelier on it. Now up and down it goes. The ceiling. It's all plaster work. It's of the era. And they can only be described by, uh, by pictures. They got rosette, they got the edging with all the columns coming up. It's a beautiful room at that. And it's all down on the first floor. There's a lot of it down. In the twin parlors or the drawing rooms, there's two. That entire ceiling is that way. And then in the library, it was that way. And then in the center hall, it was that way. So throughout the whole first floor of the mansion, uh, all that plaster work was there. There's five fireplaces in the house, and they must have been created in Italy because they're magnificently carved marble. I got one in my bedroom that's an odd color, and then I have the two white ones are in the drawing room or the twin parlors, and the one dark brown one is in the dining room. It was quite an experience to be able to walk through the mansion and take a look at the parlor and dining rooms, the beautiful marble fireplaces 
the chandelier, which actually could be lowered, uh, I understand, from the, from the ceiling so that you could actually clean it. Um, the bookcases, the thousands of books that Michael had. And also as a tribute to Benjamin Pike, the original owner of the mansion, Michael actually had a number of telescopes and optical instruments in his library. This basement was an ordinary dank basement. Broken concrete floor, walls that were whitewashed and half on, half off. It was really a broken down cellar. So I decided to make this a very different kind of spa. I spent 650000 here. The first thing I did was tear up the entire floor and put in eight inches of concrete through the whole floor from one end to the other end. The jacuzzi was a one-piece jacuzzi. I looked all over for the biggest jacuzzi at the time, and uh, there was a place in Florida, and they sold this 12-seater, they call it, 12 foot long by 8 foot wide, say jacuzzi, one piece. I wanted one piece so there wouldn't be any leaks. It, wouldn't, well, it turned out very, very lovely. I put a sauna in and a steam room. It's a magnificent place to relax. The booths I acquired uh, from someone who had imported those from England. There's six of them, and they fit just right in the spot where I picked out. They're magnificent mahogany booths. I had them all restored, and uh, they're unusual. They're older than a mansion. Yeah, stained glass window and that old leather seats, which I replaced, old tabletops I replaced. Anyway, they totally cost me about uh, $20,000 for the six booths. Ed Koch came out and visited the house when he was uh, mayor, and he had just done a renovation of Gracie Mansion. So uh, when he came down and he saw the booths, he looked at them, he said, these would be nice in Gracie Mansion. I said, yeah, I guess they would. And he said, what did they cost you? I said, well, they cost me about 20000 So he said to me, that much? And I said, I'm not selling them. They're going to remain right here in this mansion. And that's what they are. And uh, they befit the mansion. And they're over 150, 60 years old. They came from a pub, a pub in England. Lions I brought in, they come in. They're Italian lions. They're uh, Art Deco lions. They look rough like they're concrete, but that's because they were left outside. If you polish them again, they come out beautiful marble. I got those two pool tables secondhand <clears throat> from a German club in Yorkville. Those pool tables are from the 1880s. So they're very old. The, I got one is a billiard table, five by nine, and the other one is a, a regular pool table, four by eight. And the TV room, I bought that TV, it was before big TVs came popular, and this was six foot by eight foot. It's, it was a projection. When you put it on, you could relax. Well, what I did was create a bar room here. This is the original wood. This is the original flooring. All the wood that you see in this room is since the house was built. This was, surprisingly, an old credenza. This was put together this way with a brand new top. See the two here, what gives it away, the two uh, pulls. See, they were drawers. But that's magnificent old credenza. Then I made it a, uh, a, uh, a workable bar, you know, a wet bar. It is a New York City landmark. And to the credit of the Halberian family, uh, they thought it was important that this building should be preserved for future generations and did take the imaginative uh, and far-sighted uh, steps to ensure that this happened by making it a New York City landmark. This house was one of the first 
Landmarks Chosen. I have a letter from Lindsay, 1966, depicting it as a landmark. And we went down and we encouraged it and we wanted it. My father and I, we, we said yes. When Mike would, would run these, would open up his mansion, he would have a Christmas tree sometimes, it would be a Christmas parties, he would decorate the place. Um, the, uh, the community would then show up and bring in refreshments and punch, and then we would have carolers. It was a, you know, a string quartet playing music. It was just a wonderful time and a magical time for the community. It was quite a, uh, a show place for the entire neighborhood. My sister is half owner of this house, and she came up with the idea. At first I resented it, then she, was, she had wisdom, because I was getting really too old to handle this house. It's, it's, it's too much of a burden. It's a big burden. And uh, needless to say, I'm not interested in traveling and uh, going to any resorts. I love this house, and as you say, and I spent a lot of money here. And, uh, <clears throat> and it can, it's time now. I'm sure, not my daughter, but I thought my son would like it too. But really, he can't afford it. If I gave it to him, or if I gave him my share and he paid my sister off, he could not afford it, really. So uh, it's the end of an era of uh, it's the taxation and the cost of keeping a place like this up and uh, in repair. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. The Steinway Mansion is an irreplaceable icon of our community, just like the Steinway Piano, just like Steinway Street, which is our, our, our great retail um, uh, backbone of our community. Uh, the Steinway, the name Steinway uh, adds luster. It is a name that is recognized internationally and it connects our community, the, the proud tradition of craftsmanship uh, that has existed in our community from the beginning and still exists to this day. Now we have a new group of artists moving into the neighborhood. We have a new, um, this tradition of craftsmanship has remained vibrant and alive in so many different levels from the Kaufman Astoria Studios, Silver Cup Studios, through the Steinway Factory, and many other, between a dozen other companies, a hundred other companies that uh, as I haven't even mentioned. Um, and the Steinway Mansion is a part of this. It is a part of our, an inseparable part of our community. It's like the Hellgate Bridge, you know. It, it, is, it is something that our community identifies with. Most people in the neighborhood know the Steinway Mansion and have a very direct connection with the Steinway Mansion. Even if they haven't been in the Steinway Mansion, people know about it. Um, and it is hoped that that Steinway Mansion can continue uh, its magic, I think is the word to use, uh, its influence that it has upon our community. And it continues as a resource for the Long Island City Astoria community. Um, and it is hoped that something can be found to continue this um, wonderful icon so that future generations can experience the magic that myself and many other people have been privileged to experience. I did as much as I could from 1976 to today. My father passed away in 76, I moved in, and I did as much as I could. Now I have to transfer it to someone else, and I'm hoping and praying the person who buys it will continue. I would love to see it go to the Historical Societies of Queens, Queens Historical Society, story is here, and they have a number of them, and they can all come here, and this could be their focal point, and the property I have outside could be used for fundraising and tents, and uh, they can have a uh, flea market set up, it would be a magnificent addition to New York City.